So I want to finish a series today that we've been talking about the last few weeks, um, Ordinary Women, Extraordinary Gift. And uh, some of you, uh, hopefully you appreciated Pastor Chris's message last week on the book of Ruth, and uh, just a great word. A couple weeks ago, I, I started sharing a little bit about discernment uh, that a woman walks in, and I want to, and, and how to use that discernment, and I just want to expound on that a little bit more today. Um, I want to talk to you about creating a resurrection atmosphere in your home. Ladies, I want to talk to you about creating a resurrection atmosphere in your home. I shared a few weeks ago how my mom created an atmosphere in her home that helped disciple me. She created an atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of the word, an atmosphere of prayer. As we would um, every day, almost every day, without fail, we would we would do a devotional together in the morning. We would take the word of God and begin to apply it into our lives. All those times when I didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it. And she said, we're doing this. <laughs> and, and because she wanted to put God's word into her kids' lives and to put a value system that says, you know what, out of all the things going on, it's God that matters. And my mom's the one that taught me how to pray. My mom would pray not just about big matters, but she would pray about big and small matters. She'd pray about the broken, the broken arm, but she would pray about the headache. She would pray about, you know, the, the friends that you needed at school, and she'd pray about, you know, the little things that were going on. She would always stop and pray. Well, let's pray. Well, let's pray. There was nothing too, too small to pray about. Most times we think they're too small to pray about. I don't want to bother God with that. I don't want to. No, she would prayed about them all, big or small. And yeah, she would be the one that would pray over the dinner meal. The food was getting cold because she was praying about everything. She taught me how to pray. She created an atmosphere in our home. You know, my dad, my dad absolutely led our family spiritually, but he also was, was busy working because a lot of that's what men do. We invest a lot outside of the home. We don't do a great job of investing in the home. And sometimes as ladies, we're waiting for a guy to initiate something. You're waiting for your husband to initiate something in your home. And absolutely, us as men should stop being cowards and we should initiate some things in our home. But you have a unique ability to create atmosphere in your home. And I want to talk to you about that today. My mom was critical in establishing the atmosphere of our, in our home. And I believe it's the gift of discernment that women have that holds a huge key in setting the atmosphere around them. Some ignore discernment. They ignore it. And some haven't turned it over to the Lord. And discernment, actually, the enemy will use that to make you someone who is a, uh, you walks in criticism or rejection or a spirit of control and you can develop fear and ne negativity in your home. And I want to tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. That's not God's plan. The internal, com um, the internal compass that you have as a woman, discernment, is a unique ability. Discernment's not a spiritual gift. Discernment is something God's put in you. There is discerning of spirits. I'm saying this for somebody today. There is discerning of spirits, but discernment lies within you that God has put in you. It's not in the 12 gifts of the Holy Spirit. Discernment, God has given you as a woman. And it's a unique ability of uh, this blend of emotional and intellectual understanding that gives you an amazing ability to discern things that men just don't get. We don't. And so you have an amazing ability to set the atmosphere of your home, of your workplace, even in your relationship, simply due to the gift of a discernment that you carry. When you use it in the wrong way, it'll be detrimental to all that are around you, just like the enemy would want. But when you use correctly, it brings life to the most wayward and rebellious people. So what's the atmosphere of your home? What is the atmosphere of your home? Is it negative or is it positive? Is it peaceful or angry? Is it upbeat or depressing? Is it a home of, that's a shelter or is it a home that's a storm? What's the atmosphere of your home? And you have a key to setting that atmosphere. There's a, a, a story in the Bible about Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom uh, was just minding his own business, and King David had taken the Ark of the Covenant from kiriath Jerem. We were just there in Israel. He had taken the Ark of the Covenant, and they put it on a cart, and they were bringing it to Jerusalem. And they'd only gone a few hundred yards, and the cart started to get unstable, and this guy put his hand on it, and he died. And so they said, we're leaving the cart here, and they were at Obed-Edom's house. 
And they left it there, the cart which had, which had the Ark of the Covenant in it. And the whole point was they were doing it wrong. It wasn't supposed to be on a cart. They are supposed to be carrying it with poles. And so, so here they are. It's at Obed-Edom's house for 90 days. It was there so long that in those 90 days, Obed-Edom was so blessed that David said, we got to go back and get that because he was hearing the reports of their blessing. And the Ark of the Covenant contained the presence of God. Nobody in his family got so addicted to the presence of God that all of his children and his grandchildren served in the temple. They, went, they were like, we want to be around the presence. That atmosphere that was created in Obed Edom's house, we want to be around that. There's another story in 2 Kings about Ahab and Jezebel who were so rebellious and negative and critical that all of their children and grandchildren all got captured and killed. There's a big difference between those that were hosting the presence and those that were not. You have an opportunity to set the environment of your home. As a woman, you have the opportunity to set the atmosphere of your home to a place where the presence of God rules or negative negativity and rebellion rules. Don't just sit and wait for your husband. That's not what submission is. God has given you an amazing gift to do what you can. We talked a couple weeks ago about the woman with the alabaster box who had this box of perfume that was worth a year's wages and she broke it over the feet of Jesus. And we talked about how you could have an, an anointing spirit or an embalming spirit, one that grows, leads to life or one that leads to death. And as she broke open this embalming box over there, she changed the whole environment of the place. And Jesus told her this. This is what he said about her. She did what she could. And my question is, are you doing what you can? Don't just sit and stew because your husband isn't doing what he needs to be doing. Do your part using your gifts. So I'm gonna share four things with you. Here's the first one. Set the atmosphere of your home. Be a thermostat. Be a thermostat. A thermostat sets the temperature and everything else reacts to get to that temperature. A thermometer is one that walks into a room and we react to the temperature of the room and we become like the rest of the room. In other words, we walk into a negative room and we become negative. We walk into a critical room, we become critical. We walk into a peaceful room, we become peaceful. But you could actually be the one that carries peace and the presence of God in such a way that your whole home, the environment of your home, changes because everybody else comes into what you have created. As a woman, I believe you're called to be the thermostat of your home. You have a powerful gift to create the right or wrong atmosphere in your home. There's a story of Deborah in Judges chapter four where this man, Barak, was called up to go and defeat the army of Sisera. And he didn't want to go. But Deborah encouraged him and set the atmosphere of victory. And Barak responded to her encouragement and the enemy was defeated. Her pat on the back made him feel like, if she believes in me, now I know I can do it. You know, that's what a lot of men need. I talk about this at premarital counseling all the time, that men are conquerors. We're set to go conquer something, and men need a cheerleader in their life. They need somebody that's speaking life into them, not death. They need someone that's not saying, this is where you're doing it wrong, and why can't you do it better, and why aren't you a better provider? They want somebody that will celebrate what they are doing and will pull the gold out of them to help them get to where God wants them to be. That's what, that's what men need. And sometimes we get the other side of that where we're told all the things we're not doing right. And I'll tell you, if you'll begin to speak and encourage a man into the things that he's called to do, he will begin to rise up to that place. He will begin to step into his God-given, called identity in his life as you begin to speak that over him. Ladies, your power can influence for right or wrong, for victory or for defeat. People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be, not what you nag them to be. Whether it's your husband or your children or your boss or your coworker, listen, speak to the fool in your child and the fool will rise up. Speak to the champion in your child and the champion will rise up. Speak to the fool in your husband and the fool will rise up. Speak to the king in your husband and he will hurt himself trying to please you. He will. Discern when the atmosphere of your home is negative and unpleasant and become more than a thermometer that reacts to the present climate. Instead, be a thermostat that changes the climate of your home. You can't grow bananas in Alaska, but you can in Jamaica. And probably in our greenhouse outside. <laughs> Why? Because the climate is right. 
The fruit that you want in your life, the fruit you want in your husband, the fruit you want in your kids, the fruit you want in your own life is dependent upon the atmosphere, the climate that you've set in your home. My mom understood atmosphere. She created atmosphere by establishing a foundation of God's word and prayer in our home, by keeping ungodly influences out of our home, by helping us discern friends that we would bring into our home which were good and bad influences, how to love them but not let them destroy us. She brought discipline that had substance and follow through. And she didn't allow us to walk all over her. But she did serve us. She catered to our needs, maybe to a fault. But she loved us and worked with what she could. Be a thermostat. Be a thermostat. The second thing is this. Set the climate with your words and attitude. The climate of your home is established through your words and your attitude. Now think about this. What you believe determines how you live. What you believe determines what comes out of your mouth. You spend spend a half hour with somebody, I can tell you what they believe. What you believe comes out of your mouth. And the Bible says what comes out of your mouth is life and death. Life or death. There's no other two things. Either it's life or it's death. Which one's coming out of it? And so, you know, I believe Pepsi's better than Coke. That may not be right. It's not, a, it's not an eternal matter. But the truth is what you really believe, and your belief only comes through what you're putting in yourself. What are you putting in? Because what you're putting in will determine the attitude you have about something and the words that you say. What, what are you putting in? What are you depositing in? That's why it's so important that I had a foundation of decades of the word put into my life by my parents, by my Sunday school teachers, by my pastors, by my friends. The word was put into my life. Listen, you can lift people up or you can tear them down. You can encourage or discourage. You can build or destroy. Your words will have power to set the atmosphere of your home. You can go into a hospital today which is full of a lot of people that are depressed. There's some that are getting better. There's some that are having babies, but a lot of people are depressed, right? And you can go into those situations and you can begin to speak life and change the atmosphere of that place. You can go into the place that you work that might be full of chaos and you can begin to speak life and say, you know what, I can't change my boss. I can't change my coworker. I can't change them, but I can change the way I talk about everybody that's here. And you can change the atmosphere. In your home, you can influence your home to have peace or to have no peace. The taste for spiritual things can be lost because of atmosphere. Right now, it is so easy to see atmosphere shift in homes as entertainment and media continues to degradate. And we just let those nuances into our life and we just become numb to them, to the images and to the words, and we just let them in and we become numb in our life. And the moral sense in our life begins to decay. And the attitude of our home, the atmosphere of our home, will soon begin to reflect those things that we're letting in all the time. It'll reflect it. What are you letting in and what are you setting in your home? 2 Kings chapter 4. You thought I forgot about it. 2 Kings chapter 4. I want you to read this story with me. And it, it's, it's the story about the Shunammite woman and Elisha. And the little headline of my Bible says this, the Shunammite woman's hospitality, and I would put it this way, the Shunammite woman's atmosphere she set in her home. That was too many words for him, so they just used hospitality. (laughs) She set an atmosphere in her home. I want to read what this atmosphere did and how it affected her home. Starting in verse 8. One day Elisha went to Shunamm. A prominent woman who lived there persuaded him to eat some food. So whenever he passed by, he stopped there to eat. Then she said to her husband, I know that the one who often passes by here is a holy man of God. So let's make a small, welled-in upper room and put a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp there for him. Whenever he comes, he can stay there. We could preach the rest of the message about how important it is to create a space in your home that's hosting the presence of God. That's what this represents. But we're not going to. Verse 11, one day he came there, Elisha did, and stood at the upstairs room to lie down. He ordered his attendant Gehazi, call this Shunammite woman. So he called her and stood before him. 
Then he said to Gehazi, I say to her, look, you've gone to all this trouble for us. What can we do for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I'm living among my own people. So he asked, then what should be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, she has no son, and her husband is old. Call her, Elisha said. So Gehazi called her, and she stood in the doorway, and Elisha said, at this time next year, you will have a son in your arms. <laughs> Then she said, no, my Lord, man of God, don't lie to your servant. I can't have a son. It's not natural. I'm too old. I'm going to be barren for the rest of my life. And then the woman conceived and gave birth to a son at the same time the following year as Elisha had promised her. The child grew and one day went out to his father and the harvesters. Suddenly, he complained to his father, my head, my head. And his father told his servant, carry him to his mother. So he picked him up and took him to his mother. And the child sat on her lap until noon and then died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut him in and left. And she summoned her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys so I can hurry and go to the man of God and come back. But he said, why go to him today? It's not a new moon or even a Sabbath. And she replied, everything is all right. I mean, how would you reply? Your son just died. She didn't even tell him that. She said everything is all right. She had decided in her heart where her faith was. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, go fast, don't slow the pace for me unless I tell you. So she came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her at a distance, he said to the, his attendant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite woman. Run out to meet her and ask, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your son all right? And she answered, everything's all right. Words. When she came up to the man of God at the mountain, she clung to his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in severe anguish, and the Lord has hidden it from me. He hasn't told me. And then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Didn't I say, do not lie to me? She wasn't content with the few years she had with her son. So Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your mantle under your belt, take my staff with you and go. If you meet anyone, don't stop and greet him. If a man greets you, don't answer him, then place my staff on the boy's face. And the boy's mother said to Elisha, as the Lord lives and as yourself live, I will not leave you. I'm not leaving the presence, I'm staying here. So he got up and followed her. And Gehazi went ahead of them and placed the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or sign of life. So he went back to meet Elisha and told them the boy didn't wake up. And when Elisha got to the house, he discovered the boy lying dead on his bed. So he went in, closed the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the boy. He put his mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand. And while he bent down over him, the boy's flesh became warm. And Elisha got up and went into the house and paced back and forth as he prayed and interceded. And then he went up and bent over him again. And the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. He called her and she came. And Elisha said, pick up your son. And she came and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. She picked up her son and left. We could talk a lot about that story. But listen, because of the atmosphere she created in her home, her family experienced a miracle of healing. She built a little church in her home. We know how to have church, but we need to have a little church in our homes to save our children. One where we are establishing a spirit of praise, an attitude of prayer, and a foundation of the word of God. The home is supposed to simulate the days of heaven on earth. And I want to tell you, ladies, you can help create this. The Shunammite woman, God called her a great woman, an outstanding woman. She wasn't a prophetess, she wasn't a musician, she wasn't a famous Bible teacher, but she was in the ministry. A good wife, a good mother, a good homemaker. Ladies, you are talented, equipped, you can lead, you can discern, you can delegate, you can hold tremendous jobs. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, a CEO, an entrepreneur, a business leader, but your primary ministry is to your family. Creating godly atmosphere in your home. Here's the Shunammite woman. There, there, there could have been a prophetess in the area, but Elisha chose her home because this woman had created an atmosphere of peace. Shunammite in Hebrew means peaceful plant. 
She valued the atmosphere of peace. She was a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Be a thermostat. Set the climate with your words and your attitude and set the peace level in your home. Set the peace level. Determine to be a peacemaker in your home. Make peace when there is none. Peace is not the absence of trouble. It's not the absence of enemies. You might have conflict around you, but refuse to let the conflict inside of you. Don't let the conflict overrule your peace. Proverbs 16, verse 7 says, When a person's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. When a person's ways please the Lord, makes even his enemies to be at peace. Ask God for an anointing of peace in your home, and he will give it to you. Freedom is not the absence of something. No more crisis, no more confusion, no more strife, no more disagreement. That's not freedom. Freedom is the presence of someone, Jesus, because Jesus is peace. And when he comes into the situation, he has an opportunity to deal with strife and confusion and disagreement. Ladies, you have the ability to impart peace by your words. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Listen, my wife knows when I'm stressed. I'm stressed, I'm not acting right, I'm not saying right things. Instead of coming at me, tell me what I'm doing wrong, tell me to get it together, she comes to me and she brings me peace. She has a unique ability to use words and touch that bring peace to me that usually helps me realize Oh, you're being stupid. And it brings me to peace. She has that ability over my life. Listen, when you bring peace to a family member and they don't receive your peace, you don't have to get into their struggle. You don't have to let their struggle be yours. You bring peace to them. You don't have to lose your peace because other people refuse to be at peace with you. You can walk in peace. Part of the blessing of God upon a, upon a family is peace. Peace is the absence of alarm. God commanded families to be blessed with peace. In Numbers chapter six, it says, now may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Strife, contention, resentment do not belong in the atmosphere in your home. Victory over these things begins with a thought, and defeat begins with a thought. Set the peace in your home. And the last piece is this, remove the spirit of criticism from your life. Remove the spirit of criticism. A key to changing the atmosphere of your home is removing criticism. Go on a fast from criticism. Steve Backlund talks about every year about going on a 21-day fast from negativity. Go on a fast. What if in the next 24 hours, just the next 24 hours, you decided not to criticize anyone or anything. So when you left here, you decided you're not gonna criticize the person that pulls out in front of you. And when you go to the grocery store today and the lines are long, you're not gonna criticize the person that's in front of you and how they're doing it wrong. And you're not gonna criticize that somebody in your home is not doing everything that you expected them to do. What if you change that critical nature, the critical nature that doesn't solve anything, it just criticizes. It doesn't have a, it has, criticism has no way to solve a problem. Criticism will actually stifle your creativity to solve. And Jesus is the problem solver. He doesn't want you to live in a spirit of criticism. Psalm 141 says this, Lord, set up a guard for my mouth. Keep a watch at the door of my lips. Words kill and words give life. You get to choose. Negative words create an atmosphere in which positive people cannot live. Only in a climate of faith and acceptance can risks be taken and dreams be fulfilled. Your kids will not take risks and step into those dreams if you live in a critical and a negative household. They won't do it. That's why we need to pray. As it says in Psalm 141 in the New Living, it says, Lord, take control of what I say and guard my lips. That'd just be a prayer. We should just like put that over your mirror every morning. Lord, take control of what I say and guard my lips. So how can you create the right atmosphere in your home, in your place of work, and in your neighborhood? 
A couple quick things. The first one is this. Control the climate around you. Control it. Negativity is contagious. Don't be a carrier of it. Peace is also contagious. Smile more often. When I choose to smile, I become the master of my emotions. When you are secure, you can laugh at yourself. Smiling is something we choose to do. It's an act of kindness. It's a, a gift that we give to others, especially our kids. Joy is so important. It's mentioned 180 times in the Bible. Mother Teresa said this, peace begins with a smile. Smile five times a day at someone you don't really want to smile at at all. Do it for peace. The power of a smile is enormous in creating a happy atmosphere in your home. Your children benefit greatly from a smile when they come home from school. Your husband benefits greatly when he is received with a smile when he walks through the door. You have more to smile about than to gripe about. You have more. Ask, do I want to be right or reconciled? That's a tough one. Our flesh wants to be right. Your spirit wants to be reconciled. Listen, we all have battles in life, but when the bottom falls out, what do you do? Do you blame others? Blaming only makes you bitter. Do you wallow in self-pity? Self-pity only paralyzes you and alienates others. Do you overreact? The mess isn't worth it. It's not worth it. Some people are not trying to solve a problem. They're trying to win an argument. Instead of trying to win a war where everyone loses, how about you consider changing the atmosphere and changing yourself to where everybody wins? And the last thing is this. Since when the family is drifting apart and shift the environment. A discerning woman senses when the family is drifting apart, when they're occupying common space, but they're no longer enjoying common interests. Does your family talk? Do they smile? Do they make eye contact? Or are they losing touch with one another? Discerning women can change the atmosphere. The Shunammite woman, she created a spiritual environment in her home by building a room where the prophet could stay when traveling through. One day, her son got ill. Her husband didn't think much of it, like most men. A crisis was at hand with one of the children, but the husband didn't even realize it. He just said, take him to his mother. Discerning a crisis in the lives of your children is one of your greatest responsibilities. Many times, men, we're not deep thinkers when it comes to our children. We are headliners. Just give me the headlines. The women are detailers. A husband says, I went to town today. And she says, well, who did you see? Where were they going? Where had they been? What did they say? And we're like, I don't know. <laughs> women notice things men don't. I know, I'm married to one who has an amazing radar. I might be the pilot of our home, but she is the radar. Nobody can tell a mom when a child is about to throw up. She knows. A discerning mother senses when something is not quite right with her children. And I'm usually like, oh, they're fine. And then she goes and has a conversation with it. And somehow she's able to pull things out of them that I can't pull out of them. And they wind up sharing the deep need that really was going on in their heart. Because she just knew something was wrong. And she doesn't go tell them, what's wrong? What's happening? You're not acting right. No, she goes and establishes a relationship with them and brings peace to them so that they want to open up and share. Right, Cameron? Ladies, don't throw out those out of the blue random thoughts you get concerning the safety, the health, the spirituality, and the emotional well-being of your child. Don't throw those out. They're a gift from God. When the Shunammite woman's son was sick, she dropped everything and then rocked her child. He became her priority. When the son dies, she doesn't even go to her husband. She went to the Lord first. Discernment not only sees hidden things, but knows when to reveal them. In times of crisis in your home, 
Timing is everything concerning when to unload those problems on your husband. Men feel pressure at work from facing deadlines and quotas and cutbacks and downsizing or competition for their jobs. And the Shunammite woman sensed it was no time to unload another trauma on her husband who was out harvesting. Timing. She had the right to go tell her husband and unload such a great crisis, but she felt responsibility and picked her timing. She could have sent word back to him and said, hey, you idiot, couldn't you see your boy was half dead? She put her child in the loving hands of God, and he was resurrected. Elisha came and stretched himself out over the child. He knew that sometimes if you want a miracle, you've got to stretch your faith and trust. He put his hands on the child's hands and his eyes on the child's eyes and his mouth on his mouth. And he sneezed seven times and he was resurrected. A sneeze is an involuntary catching of breath and then something violently expelling it. It's usually caused when something irritating is caught in the nasal passage, like pepper. And then the respiratory system says, chew, and spits it back out. Get out of here. Sometimes we can catch some things, like unforgiveness, bitterness, disappointments in life, that will kill our vision and stop our work. We need some spiritual allergies to sneeze out whatever we picked up that's affecting our spiritual lives so we can breathe again, so we can breathe life into our marriage, into our family, into our children. And the last thing is, listen, this didn't happen at a synagogue. This didn't happen at a church. This miracle happened in the home of an ordinary housewife who had created a spiritual atmosphere in her home where her child could experience the supernatural. Can you create an atmosphere in your home where your children can experience the supernatural? Mary cracked open the alabaster box hours before Jesus' death. The anointing spices fell at the feet of Jesus. Her worship changed the atmosphere of the room. And the aroma of her worship created an atmosphere in that home that made Jesus comfortable. Religious people, not so much. Jesus, yes. Women can create the atmosphere in their homes that welcome Jesus. And creating this atmosphere is one of the most powerful jobs on earth. Attitudes are contagious. Thankful people are happy people. Inject your home with a thankful, positive, spiritual atmosphere. Ladies, I want to pray for you to walk in this gift that God has for you. And so I I would love for all the ladies in the room to stand, whether you're single or married, divorced, any of that, doesn't matter. If you're the only one living in your home, if you're a woman, I want you to stand. And listen, there is a unique gift that God has given you. Your discernment is different than a man's discernment. You're different. You, men and women are not the same. We're different. We're created differently. We live differently. Men, we have to remember when our wife or, or a girl or a lady comes and tells us something, sometimes we need to say, I wonder if it might be right. The more that I'm around my wife, the more that I know her discernment is true. Or when I was younger, I would laugh it off. Ladies, I want to tell you, you matter. You have a gift for the world that is needed and necessary, so much that God said that a woman was necessary. It was not good for the man to be alone. But he wanted to create something in you that was unique and different. And I'm sorry that the world is trying to steal the identity of a woman in today's world. Is trying to steal the identity of a woman. And I want to pray over you. I want to pray a couple things. I want to pray that the lies that have been spoken over you would be broken. I want to pray that the discernment that God has given you would be unleashed. And I want to pray that you'd have the ability to set the atmosphere in your home. And so I want you just to close your eyes and hold your hands out like you're going to receive something. 
Heavenly Father, I pray over these valuable ladies, over these women, Lord. Father, I pray for them today. I'm so thankful, Lord, for the gift of woman because you knew us men needed it. I pray and I'm thankful, Lord, for this gift. And Lord, there has been an assignment from the enemy to lie to them about this gift of discernment, to lie to them about their value and their worth, to lie to them about their place in society, to lie to them about the position in their home. And so, Father, I ask right now, in the name of Jesus, that every lie that's been set up against these ladies would be broken right now, that it would be pulled out right now, Lord. Those words that have been said years ago from other men that have tried to disempower women, I break the power of that lie off your life right now. Holy Spirit, we need your help right now. Will you come and pull those roots out? The lies that have been said over the value and the worth of these women, I pray right now that they'd be pulled out in the name of Jesus. Every lie that comes up against the value that you have put in these women, I ask right now that it would be uprooted and pulled out in the name of Jesus Christ. You have no authority to speak value over these women. You have no authority to try to define them. You have no authority over their lives. And I break you right now in the name of Jesus. We break the assignment you have over women. We break the assignment, the, the lie that's happening over women in our nation right now in the name of Jesus. We take authority over that lie. And we break it in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that you have made women you unique and special to be a woman, not to be anything but what you created them to be. And I ask you right now, God, that you would strengthen these women in this room, Lord, and that they would proudly walk in the gift that you've given them. God, I pray for the spirit of discernment, God, that they would walk in discernment, God. They would be able to, to walk freely in the gift that you've given them, Lord, that would create peace that would create joy, that would create harmony, that would bring strength to families, that would bring insight into relationships. God, I pray that you would strengthen the gift of discernment over their lives. And I ask you, Lord, that you would give these women a vision to create atmosphere in their homes. God, I pray for the vision that they need. I know the vision my mom had for the atmosphere in our home. Lord, I pray that you would give these ladies vision for the unique homes that they live in and the things that they can do to establish and an atmosphere of supernatural joy, an atmosphere of supernatural peace, an atmosphere that acknowledges the presence of God where miracles and healing take place. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'd give them the ability, you'd give them the understanding, Lord, that you'd give them the opportunity to set the atmosphere in their home. And I release that over you today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God praise. Come on, men, stand up. <clears throat> men, I want to tell you, the greatest thing that you can do is repent. Repent for your misunderstanding. Repent for not knowing. Repent for not giving space. When your wife has tried to encourage, she's tried to set a tone, she's tried to set an atmosphere. And you don't have to make a big deal out of it, but you could say a few words that will actually release her. And it might be as simple as this, that sometime today you might say, I'm sorry that I've missed it and I've stifled your gift. You don't have to go any further than that. You could just say, I'm sorry that I've missed the discernment that you walk in. I'm sorry that I haven't empowered you. It can be a short three or four words. I encourage you men, if you'll do that, you will empower your wife, the girls in your home, the daughters you have, to walk in strength and to walk in grace. Father, as we leave this place today, Lord, we don't wanna just hear a message, but Lord, we want a deposit from heaven that actually allows us to have a lighthouse in the place that we live. God, I pray for miracles in these homes. Lord, I pray that when they lay hands on one another, they would be healed. I pray, God, when they confess to one another, they would be healed. I pray, Lord, that when somebody steps out in faith to encourage, that seeds would launch men and women and boys and girls into destiny. God, I thank you that you give us an opportunity to see what can be, not what was. 
Lord, help us all not to be critical and negative, but Lord, to look unto you, the author and finisher of our faith, that you would work miracles in and through our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. If you need prayer this morning, we'd love to pray for you. You can drop your connection cards, your offerings on the way out, anything you want to do with the Jeremiah 29 initiative. Go, be blessed, have a tremendous day. God bless you.